Mr. Andy News got us a new video. Why Ruizer's revelation about Eris changes everything. Eris? I didn't hear anything about Eris last episode, but hey, let's see what Mr. Andy News has to say. Ruizer's return came with more than just two little sisters for Rudy. What the anime passed off as a relatively somber reunion was in actuality a revelation containing so much more. Eris. Specifically with regards to how Rudy's perceived Eris' departure over the past few years. Because Rudy thinks that she just left him, but Eris was like, I'm going to become stronger and more independent. And it's kind of a miscommunication, but you know. This wasn't just a simple passing thought, but instead a genuine concern that stuck with him for many days after. At least up until that incident with Norn. So, as we look at that and the introduction to Norn and Aisha, there's quite a- This is light novel Eris, yeah? Let's see it. Let's see her. Damn! Oh, this is like- it almost looks like her hair is being cut off here. It is. This is the hair that she cut off. But it's like a cool scene where she does sh really quickly and then cameraman's right there to capture the light novel cover. As we look at that and the introduction to Norn and Aisha, there's quite a bit in between that you're gonna want to hear about. Let's get started. No ad? Episode 40. No ad? Norn and Aisha. Okay. Covering chapter 12 from volume 10 of the light novel and chapters 1 to 3 from volume 11. After having sat down with Ruijerd to reconnect, the first thing Ruijerd had asked was actually about Eris. The anime simply mentioned how things got complicated, but it was in the novels that Rudy recounted pretty much everything. Why did the anime skip everything about Eris? Because I suspect that Eris is going to show up as a bombshell at one moment. And the more that we make people kind of forget about Eris, the more that we don't talk about her, the more shocking it'll be when she comes back. I, I don't know. Why did they skip Eris again? From the moment he left to the night they spent after, Rudy told Ruijerd all about how Eris had left him. She fucked he then me and spoke left. His despair and the two years he spent searching My for dick Zenith, don't work. Then his encounter with Alina Lise and even the recommendation from the Man God. It was any and everything Ruijerd had missed, all the way up to Rudy's wedding. Basically, Ruijerd had a little bit of a marathon in Mushoku Tensei Season 2. Now, the reason Ruijerd was so confident that this was all just a misunderstanding was because to him this was something that happened often. It's something that happens quite often. I suspect it's a sickness that afflicts warriors. Uh, you, so, warriors quite often just fuck and chuck? This, like, what Eris did is like common within warriors? Really? As he explained to Rudy, something like this was an outlook warriors often got bogged down by. What? A mindset Ruijerd was certain Eris- No, no. It's like, I need to be stronger, therefore I need to leave. That's what it is. Not really about one night stand and leaving. It's more about, I need to become stronger, more independent for you. I need to leave. ...couldn't possibly hate Rudy with. So, that's when Ruijerd would suggest Rudy should think a bit more literally, and it was that thought which made Rudy reconsider everything. He began to wonder if it was him who got it all wrong. What yeah. if Eris really did just leave to get stronger? Yeah, that's it! What if she it. was truly just trying to achieve balance then come back later? If this was the true intent of the simple message she had left for him, then the meaning behind her words were also just as simple as, wait for me. And then we just like jumped conclusions, right? I mean, Rudy's not the most emotionally mature person. That was like his first time being like, sexually vulnerable. Now people have some hot takes about that scene, right? A lot of people are mad, a lot of people are happy. Some people say Rudy groomed Eris, and this is a sickening act of, you know, the P word. And other people say, nah, Eris overpowered Rudy, manipulated him, and said, you know, didn't she do a cat girl line, something like Nia? Have my babies Nia? And then she manipulated and forced Rudy. I don't fucking know. I don't really think that really matters. But I just feel like Eris being left out for so long, and then Sylphie coming in, and that Rudy having all these, you know, bad memories of Eris. But now, there was, what, what did Sophie say? Sophie was like, maybe I can't have babies. We need a concubine. Is this where Eris comes back and then has Rudy's babies? Is, is this how it works? Are we going to have kittens? It was a terrifying thought that made Rudy shudder at what it could possibly entail for him. Now that he had finally overcome his trauma and been saved by Sophie, he couldn't imagine coming face to face with Eris again. He really burnt that fucking hair. It was a gift, but uh, he needs to get over it. Even if there was the chance that they could make things right, just the possibility of her rejecting him again was enough to make him want to avoid such an encounter. So, Rudy would change the topic to something else, and that's when we find out more about what it is Ruijerd had been doing. 
Uh, you see, reputation. his time in the Southern Forest was actually spent searching for Spurred. If oh, they were going to be hiding anywhere, then this was the most likely out of all the places in the Central Continent. I actually don't know how many spirits there exist. I thought that like spirits were like very little few, but I guess there still exists some tribes here and there. It was after two years of exhaustive searching though that no trace of his fellow spurred could be found anywhere. None? He did find several items belonging to some unlucky casualties of the displacement incident, but no actual clues towards any of his own people. Huh. Rijard then headed to Eastport to catch up on information coming out of Millis, and that's where he met up with Paul. He was initially planning to head to the conflict zone and search through there next, this but after meeting so Paul, big. that's when a little detour was decided. The chance encounter with him and Norn is actually something that happens in a bonus chapter, but rather than explain that detail for detail, the Sparknotes version is essentially this. Norn gets upset because she can't that was not an ad. stay with Paul, storms off and gets into a bit of trouble, then gets saved by Rijard, who then walks her back to Roxy and Lilia. Classic L sister Norn, fucking shit up, getting herself in trouble, burdening everyone around her, and getting bailed out. No, no, Norn's alright, Norn's alright, she had a lot of development in the most recent episode. Now, it was the speed in which they got here which highlighted Aisha's intellect, since not only did her suggestion ensure they traveled both during the day and night, but she had even optimized their path to ensure whichever caravan they were on was always the fastest. It's not fair. Aisha's just not fair. How is she this fucking competent? This sometimes involved doubling back to a city they'd already passed, since a caravan which left from there had a more direct route than a caravan from anywhere else. It was the first time in a while that Rijard had been ordered around like that. Alluding By Aisha? Time back when he was Whoa! The other spares. Yo, what is this? Like the fucking Elite 5? This is a hype picture, but Aisha just like ordering Ruijur, that's a very funny image in my head. Still the captain to Laplace. So, as Ruijur- Wait, 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 wait. He was still the captain of Laplace. So, go, as- Go, 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 From anywhere else. What'd you say? It was the first time in a while that Ruijur had been ordered around like that. Mm. Alluding to his time back when he was still the captain to Laplace. Damn. So, as Ruijur worked as both caretaker and guard, Aisha too would tirelessly work to calculate the most efficient route for them. Look at this, Aisha fucking studying, making sure that the route is optimized while Norn is sleeping. You think Norn even knows what the word optimized means? It was a no-breaks plan that took little account for stamina, eventually leading both her and Norn to collapse from exhaustion park. And this was Zanaba's guard. Uh, fuck, I forgot her name again. Spice? Cinnamon? Gertrude? Gary. This is a guard. Zanaba's guard. Ginger! <laughs> I was close. I was. I said spice, cinnamon, Gertrude, G, Gertrude, Ginger. I was close. I was close. Part way through. Now, if you're wondering why it is Rager's only staying for less than a day, the main reason is because he heard rumors of a devil out in the woods. A devil. Since his goal was to find more of his people, Rager figured this rumor was one worth investigating. You think it's gonna be a spared waifu that Rager finds, and they're gonna be able to repopulate the? I don't know, the endangered species. One that was likely a little bit time sensitive. This was the reason Rijard had given on the surface, but for Rudy, he also couldn't help but feel like a rift had formed between them. He knew him not being with Eris likely came as a shock, but perhaps it was the two of them together that formed the foundation for all three of them to get along. Dead end. That was a good fucking party, man. I mean, there was a clear loneliness in the way Rui Jird spoke, and it was Aww. very likely Rudy being with Silphy just didn't feel right to him. Oh, Rudy I is married, right? Got a family, and Rui Jird kind of feels lonely. I mean, he could be like the godfather. I would totally be fine with Rui Jird being the godfather of my child if it was with, like, Silphy or even Eris. That's not to say Rudy regretted what he had done, but in this conversation with Rui Jird, he couldn't help but feel as if he'd made some kind of mistake. It was shortly after that Silphy would come in and meet Rijard here, and the exchange between them was a little <laughs> dot, bit short. Dot, dot, the dot, full extent dot. was an awkward handshake and a simple uh, exchange of names. Hello. Rijard would then head upstairs and go to bed, and Silphy would question if she'd done something to offend him. Of course, Rudy wasn't going to say that she did, but even he could tell that his marriage to Silphy bothered Rijard. Not jealousy. Kind of jealousy. But he doesn't feel hostile towards Rudy. He just sees what Rudy has and sees that he doesn't what he doesn't have and kind of feels bad and it's like, damn, my boy already got a wife. 
Shit. What am I doing? A bit. As for where Richard slept, since there wasn't any specific room that Rudy had picked out for Which him, room? Rudy just said that he could sleep anywhere. Mm -hmm. It may be a bit surprising to know Master he bedroom? to sleep in Norn and Aisha's room, but Rudy understood that this was just part of who he was as a guard. Wait, so he slept in Norn and Aisha's room? He understood that this was just part of who he was as a guardian. I don't think that's weird. I don't think that's weird. I mean, they were always camping outside, Norn and Aisha, they were traveling together. I mean, even when it was just him and Eris, Richard never took his eyes off them even when they were sleeping. Gotta protect so, the kids. Though to us it may seem like something strange, this was completely normal behavior for someone as protective as Richard. That's right. He had a whole thing about protecting children, right? And stuff like that. Besides, if it was something suspicious... Good call. He did. Season 1 flashback. Not flashback. Around the campfire when we first got Mana uh, disastered, right? And we're talking around the campfire. That scene where Richard fucking pops off, right? The whole backstory with the curse of the spear, and the wife and the kid. He did have a family. It's not that he never had it. He did have a family. And now it's fucking gone. And he sees what Rudy has. Then that hurts even fucking more. But, hey, maybe they're the devil in the forest. Could be. Could be another fucking spare. Rudy ain't his son? That, that is some like, what is it? Greek god fucking lore? Isn't there some kind of like dude that got like so scared of his offsprings taking his like legacy that he started to like eat his children or some shit until one of his sons decided to fuck his mom and kill the dad or some Kronos? <laughs> yeah, this, this, the lore goes crazy. It's just then Rudy knew Richard never would have let his footsteps be heard in the first place. Now. The next morning started rather differently since while normally Rudy would be mm. horny beyond control, that sensation simply wasn't present today. Wait, because Rudy's here? The thought of Eris weighed so heavily on his oh, mind gosh. that gloom and restlessness were the only emotions he was feeling right now. Fix the fucking dick. Don't tell me, it's gonna go down. Eris, come on, man. Still, he would get up and get ready to exercise, but as soon as he stepped outside, you know what Body. was happening. This scene was so interesting because obviously the demons, well, demon god Laplace and the spirits, you know, the curse of the spears and shit like that too. But he's a demon king. Spirits and demons in general, just very, very bad. I don't know. Isn't a spirit basically, what race is a spirit actually? I mean, I, I know it's a spirit, but is it like a subcategory of what's known as a demon, right? Because demons are very... Wide ranging. Roxy is a demon. Different tribe. Spirit is like a demon tribe. Am I correct? They are demons. Exactly, right? So, Body Gotti, the demon king, and Spared here. What's going on? Standing in front of him was the immortal demon king and the captain of the Plas's Imperial Guard. Two warriors who fought on opposite sides and more than likely. Right, because of the war, right? That's why there's so much animosity. Knew each other from all those centuries ago. Do you think they you fought each other? things were tense, since not only was Bodyguardi not wearing his usual smile, but Rudy could sense Richard's potent killing intent. Richard looked like he was sweating. He no intention of yeah, right here, this frame, he was fucking sweating, bro. I've never seen Bodyguardi that, that fighting, serious before either. His noticeable aura clearly dictated otherwise. As for the potential grudge these two shared, well, with Richard having been a victim of the curse's madness, it was more than likely him and his comrades ended up killing some of Bodyguardi's. That makes Given sense. their behavior was to attack any and everyone, there was no doubt that that had to have included some of Bodyguardi's people. So, with Bodyguardi being the king he is, it didn't matter that he was uncommitted to his role as such. If someone did wrong to his people, then it was likely he sought out revenge for them. They're just kind of on the wrong side at the- I, I don't know. The whole shit is blamed on Demon God Laplace, but like Bodyguard, he probably didn't have any choice in it. He just had to participate. And then the spirit's madness obviously caused them to just go crazy. So it's just like shitty for everybody. And if not for something as petty as revenge, then perhaps he just acted in the way of justice on behalf of all his powerless citizens. Either way, there was no doubt Richard killed some of Bodyguardi's people and Bodyguardi went and got his revenge for it. This brought into question whether oh, this scene, Bodyguardi this scene, this knew scene. the truth of why the Spurred even acted that way. This scene- Yo, I'm just starting to realize this scene kind of reminds me of the bread scene. The way that the bread scene in season 1, the way that it crumbled open, 
It looks like how Ruijer is turning around. This brought into question whether Bodyguardy knew the truth of why the spur like acted that way, and it was something Rudy Maybe? felt he needed to talk with him about. There's no explanation as to why Bodyguardy just walked away at the end of it, but at the very least, we now know a bit of his history. It's Bodyguardy probably saw that Rudy is with Ruijer, and he's like, even though you know Ruijer fucked up, Bodyguardy probably acknowledges what Laplace did was also fucked up, right? And then now that Rudy is with them, he probably is like, you know what? He's probably a decent guy, but I'm going to get myself out of here because of the past drama. Seems there's at least one person that Bodyguardy doesn't get along with. Now, one of the more important things to note from Rudy Jurd's departure is the extent to which Eris is affecting Rudy's handling of it. You see, okay. while there are all these things and all these people Rudy wanted Rudy Jurd to see, this looming thought of Eris prevented him from asking Rudy Jurd to stay longer. Once again, it wasn't because of Sylphie, but was instead simply due to this feeling that he couldn't talk properly to Rui Jordan until things were fixed with Eris. And like, Sylphie has no idea of what happened. Right? I don't, I, I don't know. At least in the anime, I haven't seen a scene where Rudy was like talking to Sylphie about Eris, which is a probably a shitty thing to do. Like, you should never talk about your exes or, you know, your, your past, you know relationships with another girl that's in the moment because you should be focusing on her but when is selfie going to realize that eris did that would there be rivalry would they hate each other are they gonna be you know main wife and concubine and peace i don't know it's for that reason rudy lets rager to go and it's a good example of just how much eris is weighing on both of them right now it's when we get to Rudy's conversation with his sisters after that a few minor details were left out from it. Aisha's mannerisms were way too formal for Rudy's liking, and it was something Aisha mentioned came from him. She was <laughs> merely formal? reciprocating the way Rudy talked to her before. Okay. It's not that speaking so formally was necessarily bad though, but it was almost as if Aisha took Rudy's politeness to mean he wanted to keep her distant from him. So like... The light novel actually did cover it. It's cut content. Sophie knows? Really? And then that Sophie would give her a piece of it. So Sophie versus Eris, you know? You know what? I kind of want to see a fight between Sophie and Rudy. Who would win? Sophie versus her. Sophie versus Eris. Who would win? Um, shit. I feel like Eris might win. I don't know. Sylphie, she's too happy, there's marriage, and yes, yeah, she was a guard, but like, yo, Eris has been grinding. Eris has, you know, Ruizhri, Ghislaine, and there's some other spoilers that I kind of, eh, but like, I, I, I think it relates to one of the girls that we saw back in part one of season two. It, it was someone that was related to, there was this one moment, that I think when the animals were all in heat. And like there was this one fucking moment where uh, we saw this one girl and somehow she relates to, like she's like also like a disciple that was like training with Eris under some other ma master that I should have no knowledge about. But I don't think that Sophie and Eris, it's close. Maybe it's like one-sided. Maybe Eris is insane now. Maybe. It made Rudy question if this was how it was when he talked to everyone, and even made him think perhaps he should start talking more casually to people. Aisha would then ask about Eris, and though you would expect Rudy to be rather discreet about it, he had actually given a basic rundown of pretty much everything that had happened. Even the erectile dysfunction? You're gonna tell that to Aisha and Nor? Minus all the more mature stuff. <laughs> can't, can't tell the kids that shit, man. Stuff. Rudy had given both Norn and Aisha an if we told Aisha that, she would probably come up with the formula for Viagra, though. She would figure it out, because she's so competent. An update on how his life has been. That's when Aisha would present Rudy with the chest, and within was enough money to last the three of them a decade. So long as Rudy spent it wisely, the funds Paul provided were actually quite plenty. Nice. Within the chest was also a letter from Lilia, and it was here that she had given her opinion on Norn and Aisha. To oh? her, Aisha was extremely gifted. A child who knew she was... Is this Lily about to shit on Norn? ...smarter than others, and that unfortunately left her a little bit prideful. Norn, on the other hand, was completely ordinary, so when compared to her sister, who was objectively amazing, <sighs> this left Norn both sullen and withdrawn. She did act tough to make herself seem stronger, but Lilia knew this was all just an act. Skill is <laughs> So, given what Lilia knew, she advised Rudy to be strict with Aisha, while at the yeah. same time be kind and gentle to Norn. But like, aren't you basically just like spoiling Norn even more if you're gonna be kind and gentle? 
Isn't Norn like this because not only due to her innate lack of talent, but because Paul like spoiled her and just kind of let her do whatever she wanted and, and doted on her? If we're gentle and kind, isn't that just doing the same shit? Or maybe it's like less of hard discipline and I don't know, like last episode, right? Rudy just kind of being there, apologizing, just being so empathetic. That's kind and gentle, right? That's not really they spoiling, were instructions is it? that seemed a bit unfair to Aisha, but perhaps this was Lilia seeing herself as Paul's mistress still. Perhaps so, is Lilia a concubine? Or is she like second wife? I don't know. Perhaps if she acted like the second wife she officially was. Every time I ask a question, he just answers it as soon as I unpause. It's... <laughs> then maybe she would have been less soft on Norn and more so to Aisha. <laughs> now, to further contrast Norn and Aisha's differences, whereas Aisha was beginner in Water God style and beginner in all six basic elements of magic, Yo, she Norn fucking has Water God style? and average. She would test right in the middle of all her classes, whereas Aisha aced everything from literacy to geography. You know, they're... Because they're still kids, you never really know how how they're going to turn out because like very smart kids, very genius kids that's often told like you're amazing, you're amazing. They have, they get a twisted sense of reality thinking they, they get, they start like power trip and they think that they're God. And then eventually they kind of become, uh, what's the word? <sighs> they lose sight of what they need to do and will then become kind of like losers. Like, plenty of people that were, that kind of, it's basically peaking as a kid. And then, if you never experienced failure, maybe that's just going to crumble you. That happens to a lot of kids where the world kind of, just like your parents, your teachers, everyone, they, they tell you you're so gifted, you're so gifted. This is actually kind of me, where in high school, elementary school, growing up, because it was like a very relatively small town, and I'm Korean, so I have a shitload of fucking math skills. And we're in a fucking redneck town where the education's not that good. Relative to them, I'm a fucking genius. And they hype me up and hype me up. Oh, you're going to be amazing. And then it gets into my head. And then I go to fucking university. And then I meet all these other kids. That's just so much smarter than me. So much gifted. And I didn't really experience failure on that level before. And then it's just like, shit. I was just a fucking frog in the well. And when you don't know how to cope with failure, all that talent at the beginning is just wasted. And my point here with that story and Norn and Aisha is that if Aisha doesn't kind of maintain this mentality and, and, and like she could kind of falter in the future, while Norn, because she's always been living an L all her life, she get kind of used to failure and eventually perseveres and can work hard and then perhaps even better. So like Aisha is cracked in the early game, but depending on how you manage it, it could really crumble down while Norn is like scaling late into the end game slowly. You know what I mean? They were completely different in every way imaginable. This was clearly something Norn was very sensitive about since while the argument in the anime was verbal at most, a bit of a fight broke out the more Aisha insulted her. Norn had grabbed Aisha's hair first, then the two devolved into back and forth pushing and pulling. I want to see a fight between the kids. Luckily, it wasn't anything as serious as punching, but the tears in Norn's eyes made it clear Aww. topics like this were touchy. Now. The next day, Rudy would go schedule Norn and Aisha's test with Genius, and it was after that that he would ask about Bodyguardi. Unfortunately, Genius hadn't seen him, but if he did, he would tell him that Rudy was looking for him. Rudy would then go check up on Nanahoshi, and to his surprise, she wasn't doing any research at all. What? Since their party was just the day before, she was actually in bed groaning about her hangover and head. <laughs> okay, the two would she's then go into a conversation about siblings, and aside from the rare compliment about Rudy's appearance, we would wait, 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 the rare compliment about Rudy's appearance. By the standards of our old world, you're an objectively handsome. Yeah, Rudy is pretty good looking. Thank you, Paul. Paul's genetics. I don't know what you would look like on the other side. <laughs> but right now, you could pass for a European model. Yeah, I, I think Rudy is objectively pretty damn good looking. But, like, I don't know what you... <laughs> we were so close. She... Because, like, she was right across the street at that 7-Eleven when we got, like, killed. About Rudy's appearance. We would also find out Nana yeah, right was a brother of her own. Sylphie would be who Rudy would meet up with last, and while the majority of their conversation was pretty much how we saw in the anime, 
An interesting question was posed which I think is important to the Sylphie-Ariel relationship. What? Rudy had asked if she would have accepted the marriage if he told her to quit her job first, and Sylphie responded simply by saying no. Yeah, really? There was a good chance she would have turned him down in an ultimatum like that since the love she felt for Ariel was just as strong as the love she had for Rudy. That's a red flag. Is it? In terms of finding a par long lifelong partner? So, I thought that Sophie would be like, fuck Ares, Ari Ariel, I'll, I'll just be with you, Rudy. But really, re hmm, maybe Ares coming back ain't so bad after all, guys. Yes, the types of love were fundamentally different, but a love like that was enough to make Sophie want to be there for her. Especially since Sophie knew Ariel wasn't the type of person who could take care of herself alone. That's why Sylphie knew she couldn't abandon her, and though she felt it was kind of unfair to Rudy, Motherly it was a strong instincts, conviction kinda? she was willing to stand by. Of course, Damn. such a thing wasn't unfair at all, but to Sylphie she probably felt like she was taking advantage of Rudy. It was clear she felt bad that she had to split her time so much. Fast she felt like she was taking advantage of Rudy because of that? Forward to after Norn hmm. and Aisha had taken their tests, and because Aisha had gotten a perfect score, not only did she earn the right to become Rudy's personal servant, but she'd also been offered- Not only did she get a perfect score, she got the right to become Rudy's personal servant. Wow. Wow. Imagine that, guys. A acing a fucking test and you become a fucking slave. Offered admission as a special student. Of course, her desire trumped such a privilege, so it was from this point on that Aisha would be a maid. Is that- Good use of her talents, though? I don't know. I feel like she should be at school with Julie and fucking, I don't know, like, making use of her talents, but she wants to be made. Okay. Norn, on the other hand, wasn't quite so exceptional, but the reason Rudy decided to give her what she wanted was because to deny her request may make her resent him more than she does already. Since he knew what it was like to be a shut-in himself, he also knew what not to do when trying to fix someone like that. You see, whenever his own family had tried to engage and make him feel better, each time it had only made him withdraw further from them. To him, it made him feel like some sort of animal rather than a human. That's the thing, man. When people are super depressed like that, they tend to just like lash out or even just reject people that's outright trying to help them. That's why you can never tell them that like, even like the advices were like, oh, you know, other people are suffering. You got it pretty good. Your life ain't so bad. Come on, man. Just cheer up. Just walk it off. But it's like, that will never work. That'll just like make them retreat more. So what do you got to do? Uh, break into their dorm, stand out, stand there, quiet, and then say sorry. And then Norm will cry. Easy. So in an effort to make Norm feel like she wasn't trapped like how he felt, Rudy thought it was best to keep an eye on her from a distance. Plus, with Aisha always being so condescending, it was probably better for Norn's development if she didn't have to deal with all that. And since Rudy knew what it was like to grow up with exceptional siblings, he understood why such an in I did not know that, I didn't realize. Well, I guess exceptional relative to him? ...environment would be so unappealing for her. That said, getting Aisha to understand this was a whole different problem. Since to her, Norn didn't seem like she deserved this treatment, Rudy needed to explain why without saying, because I said so. Aisha, yeah, how do you tell this girl, right, to Norn, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, even to Aisha, yeah, someone as gifted as her, probably this just doesn't make sense, like, why are you being so nice to this girl that's so useless, but it's like, we need to give her more resources. This is where it's called, like, equity, where it's just like, um, is, maybe, is that the right word? I forget, it, it's basically like, even if all the playing field is even for both girls, because you're more talented, the other girl needs even more extra help to balance it out. If the goal is to give them a really good chance at becoming kind of similar. Explain why without saying, because I said so. That's when he would think back to what his parents would always say, and it was from this that he knew the basic answers just wouldn't work with her. Since they never satisfied him, he figured it was best to try something different. So, this was three examples where Rudy used his past life to his advantage, and they were all for the betterment of the sisters he was now taking care of. There's a lot of past life moments that's been kind of um, revisited during this season. The last time before this was... Nanahoshi! That was straight up Nanahoshi, right? There's a Nanahoshi depression. The other one was... Julie? 
when Julie looked like she was suicidal and we're like, you know, I can just end you if you'd like. It's just mercy. But a lot of times that, you know, revisit back to Rudy's like um, past and how he learned from those lessons and how he can now approach it differently, which is, I guess, pretty good writing. It's rather rare we see Rudy reflect on his past life so much, but I think it's important to know since it shows that he's learning from it. It exhibits a level of responsibility and compassion that may not have already been apparent in this scene. I think this is why a lot of people say Mushoku Tensei is not as bad as people say because Rudy's development is quite amazing. But sometimes Rudy does fuck shit up, right? Like even in part one, everyone was like, yo, what do you mean Rudy is like such got good development? He's still such a fucking degenerate. Like, what do you mean he's changed? I mean... He did go back to his degenerate tendencies here and there. There's like moments of weakness, but overall, compared to like who he was before, I feel like he's changed a lot. Now, to add a bit more context as to why Aisha felt so strongly about this, it essentially boils down to Lilia and the Latria family. Who the fuck is this grandma? Oh, hello, she's like a gilf. What I mean is that if Aisha's own mother was never able- Ah, Latria, Aisha Latria. Interesting. Well, to consider herself the second wife of Paul, then it makes sense Aisha would never feel equal herself either. Then, with Zenith's family reinforcing this idea by treating her as this illegitimate daughter, it was only natural Aisha channel all that hate towards trying to be better than Nor. Um, so this is where, remember Aisha was crying, so we said grandma said something, right? Remember how Aisha was crying and be like, is that because, like, my mom's a whore, grandma said something, right? That's the grandma. So, is that, is that true? People were like, no, it's fucking, uh, it, it's fucking Norn's side, it's the Dennis side, but no, no, it's Aisha's side. So, the Latria grandma was like, we are a noble family, and my daughter cannot be a concubine, you must be at least second wife, or even that, the shame. So, she kind of just like whispered into Aisha that like, you or that you are an illegitimate child, illegitimate child, you better fucking try harder than anyone else. And then, oh, this is Zenith's mom? I'm confused. This is Latria. Oh, my bad. Okay, okay. My, my, I had a bad understanding. Gotcha. It's not Aisha Latria. It's Zenith Latria. Got it. I thought this is like Aisha's grandma. Okay, okay. This makes even more sense because it's like, why the fuck would like Aisha's grandma just like, you know, shit on her? But it's like, well, it's not grandma. It's like mom, right? So it's Zenith's mom. And that makes sense because it's like, what the fuck? We have secured Paul and the Grey Rats and it should be, you know, like this. But then this fucking whore maid comes in and does that. So she then takes that personally and then whispers into Aisha. <laughs> you think Paul fucked her? You, you guys think so? I mean, I mean, I could definitely see a future where <laughs> Paul fucked the grandma. This idea by Don't let Zenith this know. Legitimate daughter. It was only natural Aisha channel all that hate towards trying to be better than Norn. It's not like Paul treated them any differently himself, but with everyone else making that difference so apparent, such circumstances were all but bound to create a divide between them. Fortunately, none of those people were around anymore, grandma, so for Norn and Aisha, this was kind of a fresh start for them. They both just needed to get past their own built up mentalities first. So, it was a few days later that the decided plans would be put into action, and with Norn's enrollment pretty much secured, Aisha had settled nicely into her position as maid. The amount of chores she did extended far beyond just the ones we saw in the anime. Really? She would even entertain guests whenever they came over, and Doing the usual what? person was Nanahoshi when she wanted a bath. It was a level of hospitality she Nanahoshi, bait Nanahoshi all the time? would force on his own younger sister. It was in the rare times that she wasn't doing chores, though, that- Yeah, a lot of people are probably gonna try to cancel Rudy for getting his little sister to watch his back like that. But Rudy would sit her down and teach her magic. You see, sure, beginner spells were enough for Aisha to live a normal life, but if she ever felt the need to defend herself, intermediate spells were absolutely necessary. Okay, make her into sage so, level. Rudy would have her exhaust her mana supply every day, then give her a few homework assignments to advance her knowledge of magic. Alright, I think this is plenty enough. I don't think we need to go to the school to become good at magic. As long as Rudy's giving private lessons, that's really all we need. It was at night that Aisha would occasionally sleep in the same bed as Rudy, then whenever Silphy was home, that's when things got risky. What I mean is that, with zero privacy and zero means to blow off steam the way that- There's no... noise-canceling magic? 
because we can't be clapping cheeks with the kids inside the house, you know? Rudy normally did, there was a built-up Sylphie knew Rudy needed to satisfy. This would lead to them doing it multiple times despite Aisha being in the next room over, and the only thing Rudy could do to <gasps> Poor mitigate Aisha! the was to barricade the door with earth magic. It was definitely risky, but more than necessary for him. Did I Especially with Sophie I always prodding to do more. But yeah, Sophie that's always pretty much whispering. it for season 2 episode 16. Sophie always fucking whispering. Okay, is he gonna say something after this? I know I'm a week late, but you can expect the next episode within a couple of days or so. Alright, so we're gonna get like the most recent episode next, which is gonna be all the Norn drama stuff, right, and getting resolved. But you know what? I'm actually so excited for Turning Point 3. And oh my god, it's gonna happen pretty soon. Guys, go to Mr. Anions' channel. Subscribe to his channel. He always makes such good summaries about the missed content from the anime if you watch. I was pretty mean to Norn. Yeah, I was in this episode too, in the most recent episode, but I feel like she is more understandable. And the whole scene with Norn and Rudy making up, she, I think she's a much better character. But most importantly, I'm just more excited about tele sorry, uh, Toilet Paper 3. I cannot wait for TP3, man.